Well, stand with me, will you please, for the reading of God's Word this morning from Luke chapter 21 and beginning in verse 5. This is God's holy, inerrant Word. And while some were speaking in the temple, that was ordained with noble stones and offerings, he, Jesus, said, As for these things that you see, the days will come when there will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for this word. We ask that you will open it to us today by your Holy Spirit. Help us to gain, Father, a new appreciation for what is going on here, what it means not only to the people who are actively involved, but to us, to us. This word has been written and given specifically for us, and so we know that there is always a message here. We uh, thank you for the opportunity to worship together. We do pray, Father, that as we Uh, Worship now by the listening of your word, that you will cause our hearts to be open, that you will take away distractions, cause the ways our mind wanders to be under control, and help us to concentrate on you for these few moments. We also pray, Father, that in the coming week, you will help us to worship you daily by the way that we live to realize that just as important as worshiping you in song on Sunday and in the message of the word is the message of our life day by day. And so we want to worship you there as well. And we acknowledge we are not very good at that. We need your help to become better representatives of you, to better exhibit the glory of God in our lives that others might look to you as well and find there the glorious Lord and Savior that we have found. We pray for those who are ministering in far places um, that we have the privilege to support. Thank you for J.D. and Ashley, and we pray that you'll continue to help them as they try and raise the support that's needed to allow them to go to Canada, which which seems like a strange mission field maybe, and yet a father uh, has become a very pagan place in many ways, and so we pray for your spirit to provide and to lead them. We pray for Bob and Jan Springer as they continue to minister to you now in the States, but still providing technology to take your word via radio to far places in the world. Will you please encourage their hearts, provide for their needs emotionally, physically, spiritually? And the many others, Father, we commit them all to you, whether their need is encouragement or fundraising or whatever it is. We pray that you will bless, provide fruit for those who are going. We thank you now for this time together. We pray that you will bless it. And Lord, just before we look at your word, I just want to raise up Janet as well with the tragedy that her family has faced this week. Janet Ratzliff, the loss of a grandson, in this automobile accident, Lord, we pray for his wife, for his mom and dad, for his children. Lord, we are always staggered when these things happen. We, we are confronted, Lord, with the great issues of life and death. We're confronted with the brevity of life. We're confronted with the fact that there are no guarantees. Except you. You are the guarantee. You are the rock. You are the savior. You're the only one upon whom we can depend. And so would you bring this home, not only to us, but others. Give comfort to this family. Lord, over time, fill that hole as only you can. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. And if you have not already, please turn with me to Luke chapter 21. We begin down this uh, lengthy path in 
Luke 21 with the Olivet Discourse. You know, Winston Churchill once said about Russia, the Soviet Union, that it was like a riddle wrapped in a mystery inside an enigma by which he meant <laughs> who can understand it. In a certain sense, this passage of Scripture, going all the way through this 21st chapter, is a bit like that at first reading. It's a bit like that at second reading and at third reading. It's hard. It's difficult. It's a difficult passage. It is called the Olivet Discourse, so named because it was given by Jesus on the Mount of Olives, which is just outside of Jerusalem on the east side. The picture that you saw on the screen this morning was a depiction of what you would have seen sitting on the Mount of Olives, looking toward Jerusalem and seeing the great temple that Herod had built there. Jesus gives this discourse, probably second in fame only to his Sermon on the Mount, but because it is so much prophecy, it is difficult to interpret. It's, ter it's difficult because it is a prophetic sermon, and prophecy is always a bit difficult, challenging. It's difficult, secondly, because although it's mentioned in all three of the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, no one of them gives the full discourse. Matthew has the most of any of them. Uh, Luke adds a lot of detail, however, that's not found in either Matthew or Mark. However, the overall message is clear. Okay, so the overall message is not difficult. So here's the overall message of the Olivet Discourse. It is this. Jesus is predicting a near-term destruction, judgment on the city of Jerusalem, which prefigures end-time events that are future even yet to us. Okay, so there's going to be a near-term destruction of Jerusalem, which prefigures a greater destruction and a greater judgment yet to come. The challenge is in figuring out the timing of some of the other events that are discussed in this passage. And over the next several weeks, that's what we will indeed be doing. Now, one factor helps a lot. A careful reading of the passage in Luke versus the other passages demonstrates that Luke concentrates mostly not entirely, but mostly on the near-term destruction of Jerusalem. It's where his focus is. Matthew and Mark concentrate more on the end time events. Jesus also does one other thing, which is very common in prophecy. He uses a near-time event, a near-time prophecy, in order to demonstrate something that's going to come and find its ultimate fulfillment later. The more you study the Bible, we call these patterns or types, the more you study the Bible, the more you see that there are these patterns and types all the way through the Scripture. As God unveils His plan for history, little by little, and through sometimes small events which are intended to point toward the fulfillment that's found later in a more ultimate sense. Now, ultimately, this passage is about hope. It's about hope. And we'll see particularly this week and next week how that is demonstrated in this passage. But you'll notice that the name of the, that I've given to the series is Recalibrating Reality recalibrating reality, and you'll see why that, that, that as we go through this passage of Scripture, but it's about hope and getting hope oriented in the right direction. Hope is important to every human being, is it not? We, we live on hope. We all have hope in something, all of us. The minute you don't have hope, you take your life or you just die. One of the two. We all have hope. Hope drives human existence. Linus says to Charlie Brown one day, right, it's no use worrying about tomorrow. We should focus on today. Charlie Brown says, no, that's giving up. I still, I'm still hoping that yesterday will get better. Well, I'm glad for him, right? 
He's hoping for yesterday to get better because we all have hope. We all need hope. We're driven by the need for hope. But the hope that yesterday will get better is probably a misplaced hope, right? There's nothing more devastating than hope that is not aligned properly with reality. And that's the problem with the disciples. They have hope, but it's pointed in the wrong direction. And so the whole point of this is to get the disciples oriented rightly. Hope based on fantasy is no hope at all. Some of you may remember, may have seen or somehow became acquainted with the, the devastating story of Delise, Delise Williams. In 2005, she was scheduled to go on a program called Extreme Makeover. I've never seen that show, but I guess it's a very stirring show, right? Touching show. People go on, they get makeovers, and it changes their whole life. And she was scheduled to go on there to have this makeover that was going to, quote, transform her life and her destiny. To set up the occasion, they talked to a lot of family members and friends who described um, how they were hopeful that this would help Delise. They, they talked about how some of the things about her that were ugly and how glad they were that she was going to be able to get a makeover. I don't know whether it was teeth, whatever, I don't know. I don't know what it was, but they talked about these freely on these interviews thinking she was going to get this makeover. Hope lived. And then a glitch developed. The dental surgeons who were going to do whatever some of the dental work was announced that they would not, that the, that the surgery would take longer to heal than the show had time to allow for. And when that news was found out, the show sent Delise Williams packing back home to Texas the night before the surgeries were intended to be done. She was devastated. She said, how can I go back as ugly as I left? You know, I, I feel bad that anybody would feel that ugly, right? But, but people do. She said, I, I, how can I go back as ugly as I left? I was supposed to come home pretty. She was humiliated. She would not go out. She did her shopping at midnight in order to avoid anybody in the town. Her sister, Kelly, who was one of the ones that had been interviewed and had shared her opinions about some of the features about Delise that she hoped were going to be fixed, the flaws that would be corrected, was absolutely consumed with guilt. So consumed with guilt that four months later, she took her own life. Misplaced hope is devastating, isn't it? Hope, if it's going to help, has to be aligned with reality. And that's what Jesus is doing with his disciples here in the last days of his life. They don't realize it, but they're in a boat called misplaced hope, headed for a distant shore that doesn't exist. What they are hoping for is not what's going to happen. And despite the fact that Jesus has been trying to reorient them for a long time, they haven't gotten the picture yet. Now, they're getting nervous by this time. They're getting nervous. Things were not proceeding as they had hoped. But at this point, they're still clinging to old ways of thinking about the Messiah. They needed a reality check, and Jesus is going to give them one. He's going to reset their expectations. Their hope was pointing in a wrong direction. Jesus is going to reorient it to, to point toward true north toward what was really coming. We all need to know where things are really going if our hope is going to be fixed on the right thing, right? It'd be a terrible thing to have hope that is not the right kind of hope. So this series, Recalibrating Hope, Reality. And the outline is the reach for hope in verse 5, the repudiation of hope in verse 6. We're going to look at those two today. A reapplication for hope in verse 7. A recalibration of hope, verses 8 through 33, and obviously there'll be some sub-points there. And then a renewal of hope in verses 34 through 38. So this is the outline that we'll use as we go through this passage. So let's look this morning, first of all, at the reach for hope in verse 5. In order to grasp 
this passage, we have to understand as much as we can about the way that contemporaries of Jesus thought. And it'll help to know that they have been under domination of foreign powers for almost 600 years by this time. First with the Babylonians in the captivity when Nebuchadnezzar came in and took over, then the Medes and Persians, then the Greeks, and now by the time Jesus is on the scene, they're being dominated by the Romans. They desired nothing more than to be out from under this long national nightmare. And their hopes to get out from under this were pinned on their concept of a Messiah, someone that they felt was promised in the Old Testament, the Mashiach, the anointed one who would come, who would deliver them from bondage and set up a kingdom of unprecedented peace and joy and happiness and foreverness. Their expectations were fueled by Old Testament passages like Isaiah 9, verses 6 and 7, where we read, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be on his shoulder. His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. They were looking for that. They longed for the promise of Jeremiah 23, verse 5, where God had said, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch. He shall reign as king and deal wisely and shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. These were the visions that filled the dreams of Jesus' contemporaries. And in Jesus, the disciples thought they had found the one that had been prophesied here. Things were going quite as they expected. They were slower than expected. But they really, truly believed that very soon he would declare himself, start a revolt, and essentially kick the Romans out and set up his kingdom. So how do you know that? Well, we just saw it, right? In Luke 19, verse 11, Luke tells us what was the mindset of them. Luke 19, verse 11, he says, They supposed that the kingdom of God was to appear immediately. That's pretty clear, right? That was their expectation. That was their hope. Now, in that passage, Jesus tells them a parable that basically emphasizes it's not going to happen right away, but it went over their heads like everything else that did not agree with their theology. Hope for the kingdom lived in their hearts. And the triumphal entry that had just happened, you know, four days ago, looked so promising. And yet... Instead of taking on the Romans, the next day Jesus went into the temple and threw out the Jewish merchants. He took on the Jewish elite, the religious elite establishment, instead of the Romans. He denounced their hypocrisy. Now, from God's perspective, everything's right on schedule, right? But from the perspective of the disciples, everything is going in the wrong direction. Direction. Hope is fading a little bit. You know, uh, Chick Hearn, the old Laker announcer that I listened to for 45 years, used to say it's nervous time. Well, it was nervous time for the disciples, right? Nervous time. So what was their response? They looked for hope in the wrong place. They looked for hope in the wrong place. As Jesus departs the temple after denouncing the scribes, Luke records in verse 5 there, and some were speaking of the temple, how it was adorned with noble stones and offerings. We know who the some were that were saying this because in Mark's gospel, chapter 13, verse 1, the parallel passage, he says, and as he, Jesus, came out of the temple, one of his disciples said to him, look, teacher, what wonderful stones and what wonderful buildings. Now, you have to ask yourself, why this sudden interest in the temple? Why are the disciples suddenly so consumed with concern about how beautiful the temple is and how wonderful it is? I think it's really simple. It's because as hope is kind of slipping away as they envision it, they see in the temple something that is secure. They're looking for hope. 
And to them, the temple offers this. It's kind of like saying, look, Jesus, look, I, you know, things, things, things are, th are things really that bad? Look at the temple. Look at this beautiful place. Look at the permanence of these buildings. The temple spoke to the disciples as it did to all of Israel of God's presence. They knew the history of the temple. Around 1400 B.C., as Moses is leading the children of Israel out of Egypt, what's one of the things that they do? They get the law, and then they get the instructions for how to build this tabernacle, this place of worship, this place where God is symbolically with his people in the Holy of Holies, in the person of the cloud that had been leading them, and now it's in this Holy of Holies, the Shekinah glory, we call that, the the visible presence of God with his people. The, the tabernacle was located right in the middle when these tribes camped out there in the wilderness. It was located right in the middle with three tribes on each side. Symbolic of what? This is God with us. 500 years later, Solomon built the beautiful temple in Jerusalem that now housed the place of worship. And once again, as he prayed, the presence of God came in a magnificent way with the cloud that came and, and enveloped the people and then went into the temple. Seventy years after that, not 70 years, I'm sorry, 300 years after that, it was destroyed by the Babylonians. Seventy years later, Ezra built a new, much smaller temple with the refugees who returned from Babylonian captivity, the people who built it, some of the old-timers who were around and remember Solomon's temple cried when they saw this small new temple. But it became the place of worship for the children of Israel for the next 400 years until, until and it, a, a period of time during which the worship was interrupted only briefly by Antiochus Epiphanes, the Syrian who came in 168 and stopped worship for a brief period of time. But this was the temple that was still in service when Herod the Great came to power in the 30s B.C., the, 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 the king who was king when Jesus was born. And Herod, because he was an Idumean, which means he was a son of Esau, descendant of Esau, whom the Jews, of course, who were the sons of Isaac, hated, Herod was anxious to curry favor any way he could with the Jews. So one of the things he did was build them this magnificent new temple. And what a temple. Construction on that temple began in 19 B.C. And by Jesus' time, the, the construction had been underway for over 40 years. It continued for almost another 20, about another 15 years after that. It took that long to build it. It was one of the architectural wonders of the ancient world. Herod built a new foundation. He doubled the size of the temple grounds. Stones, and you can go and see them today, stones as large as boxcars that were quarried out of limestone around Jerusalem were used for the foundations and the walls and those stones that are huge. I mean, you look at them and you say, how could they, how did, how could they possibly put them in place? But there they are. And they were, they were so carefully Put together, they didn't even need mortar. They fit so closely together and were so huge. The foundation and the west wall of those temple grounds still exist, and so you can see them if you go there. The main temple, housing the holy place and the holy of holies, was there, built in a magnificent building, huge building. But there were in the walls and all around many courtyards, porticos, plazas, caves, cisterns, rooms, offices. Some of those still exist, and you can go through them. They're all there. It was a brilliant place. Brilliant polished marble was used for the construction of the main building that housed the holy place and the holy of holies. Je Josephus, the, uh, the, uh, the Jewish historian, says that the front of the temple was plated with gold that reflected so brilliantly in the rising sun when viewed over the Mount of Olives that, it was, that, it, that you almost couldn't stand to look at it. He further notes, but the temple appeared to strangers coming from other directions when they were at a distance like a mountain covered with snow. For as to those parts of it that were not gilt with gold, they were exceeding white. It's no wonder... 
the disciples looked at that and wondered at it, isn't it? It meant to them not just something that was beautiful, but something that was permanent. They were looking there for their hope. This is where God meets man. And so they saw the temple as the place where security was. It had been the center of, exist, of their existence all the time that they were growing up. All, for all the Jewish people, it was that way. They were required to come there once a year, the men were, to worship at the feasts. And so in referencing the temple, they're kind of saying to Jesus casually, Jesus, maybe it's not as bad, things aren't as bad as they seem. But then we get the repudiation of hope in verse 6. Repudiation of hope. Jesus is saying, actually, not only are things as bad as they seem, things are worse. The disciples are looking at an outward system that is outwardly beautiful, but it's inwardly rotten to the core, right? It's, 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 like, a, it's like a Halloween chiller where, you know, you walk in, somebody walks into a house, and they see a body on the couch covered somehow with a cloth, and, they, and the body looks fine, but they pick up the cloth, and there it is, it's just a worm-eaten, worm-infested body underneath, right? That's what the temple was. That's what Judaism was by the time of Christ. It was an amazing, it was, it was an amazingly um, tragic transformation that had occurred with the Jewish people. The temple was part of the old covenant of Moses. After God had rescued his people from bondage in Egypt, he depicted, listen carefully because this is important to understand, he depicted the whole concept of salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, by this deliverance. So many people miss this. That, you know, they, they, you hear people talk about, well, we live under grace, but they lived under law. We are saved by Christ because we believe in him, and we're saved by grace through faith, but they were saved by keeping the law. Nothing could be further from the truth. Beloved, step back for a moment and look at the big picture. Look at the big picture. The deliverance from Egypt happened before the law was given, right? There's a reason for that. God is saying Deliverance is by grace through faith. How did they get out of Egypt? By God's intervention, right? How did they get across the Red Sea? By God's intervention, not by anything that they could do or did do. It was by grace through faith. Then the law was given to help them who had gotten delivered realize how they should live in light of the deliverance God had provided and to provide the next generation of people a depiction of the standard of God of which they fell short so that they would realize the only way of salvation is by grace through faith. That's what the law has always been about. So the temple, which was part of the worship now that was established, Provided for what? It provided for the sacrificial system, which was about what? It was about getting forgiveness of sins. How? By grace, through faith, right? It's not by works of righteousness that we have done, but by his mercy that he saved, as Paul says in Titus 3, 5. And this is what he's depicting in the Old Testament. So the tabernacle or the temple in the Old Testament was to be a place of grace. It's where the people came to offer sacrifices so that they could be forgiven on the basis of the greater sacrifice that was going to happen when Jesus came. It's all grace. The message of the temple was grace. That was the meaning. But God's presence, God's presence had departed the temple long ago, had it not? If you're familiar with your Bible, you'll know that in Ezekiel chapters 8 through 11, 600 years before Christ, at the time of the Babylonian captivity, Ezekiel describes how that Shekinah glory of God that had been residing in the Holy of Holies, so that people could come and 
have forgiveness on the Day of Atonement. That Shekinah glory leaves the temple. It leaves reluctantly, comes out of the holy place, it goes to the wall, it goes back, it comes out again, goes a little further, comes back, and then finally leaves for good. Demonstrating the reluctance of God to leave, but now leaving because the people have long ago left him. God's presence left the temple never to return until Jesus walked in the door, right? The people rebuilt the temple when they came back. They still had the possibility of forgiveness, but the presence of God as a symbol was gone. When Herod built his temple, the symbol, symbolic presence of God was gone. This is why Jesus, when he came, was clear on the fact that the temple, which had represented grace, had now come to represent what? Legalism. The Jewish people had totally messed up the system of God and said, we are going to be saved by keeping the law of God. Only we're not going to really keep the law of God. We're going to keep the way we interpret the law of God. We know we can't keep it the way it's supposed to be. So we will make up our own rules about how to interpret it, and we'll keep it, and that's how we'll be saved. And so the temple, by the time of Christ, had come to represent not grace, but legalism, which is why Jesus fought that idolatrous system of legalism every day of his earthly life. Did he not? That's what he was fighting. So the temple now represented not grace, but legalism, it was vile in its representation that one could approach God on the basis of ritual and on the basis of one's own goodness. It was vile. That was the worm-infested part of it. Further, it was shot through with hypocrisy. The priests taught salvation by works, and then they turned around and fleeced their own flock by overcharging for money that they exchanged for the sale of animals for sacrifice and for just the exchange of, of money. When Jesus cleansed the temple early in his career, you'll remember in John 2, he said this, he told those who sold the pigeons, take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of trade. He was furious with the corruption. And we saw it as he cleansed the temple just a couple days before this, earlier in the book of Luke. It's for the second time, toward the end of his ministry now, he came and he cleansed the temple. And in his anger at this point, Luke 19, verse 46, he said this, It is written, My house shall be a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of robbers. Do you see the problem? The disciples, in looking to the temple for hope, we're looking to a religious system that had all gone completely wrong. They were looking for hope in the wrong place. And so Jesus, having made them very nervous, now pulls the rug out from under them completely. In verse 5, it says, And while some were speaking of the temple and how it was ordained with noble stones and offerings, he said, As for these things that you see, the days will come when there will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. You're looking for hope in that temple? It's going away. It's not going to be here anymore. It's going to suffer the judgment of God. Wow. That was a staggering statement. It would be like some of us, somebody telling us, you know what, the White House and the Capitol building are going to be blown away. Uh, any of you watching that designated, what is it called, designated survivor show where the Capitol building is blown away? Uh, it would be a similar type of feeling. We feel like the rug had been pulled out from under us, right? It's an unthinkable announcement. Now, they'd heard it before. In Luke chapter 19, verses 41 through 44, Jesus had predicted this very thing. But like us, the disciples had selective hearing. They only heard what they wanted to hear. They weren't getting that rejection meant delay. They weren't getting that when Jesus said he had to die, he really meant that. 
He'd been trying to tell them for six months, I'm going to die, I'm going to Jerusalem, I'm going to die, I'm going to Jerusalem, I'm going to die, I'm going to Jerusalem, I'm going to die. And they kept saying, I wonder what he means. I wonder what he means by that. They hadn't got yet that Jesus had to die for their sins. The ultimate sacrifice. They didn't get that. They didn't get that he would be resurrected because he kept saying that too. Every time he said, I'm going to die, he said, I'm going to be raised again. They didn't get that. He rebuked them later because they didn't get that. But they didn't get that. They didn't get that the kingdom would be on his schedule, not on theirs, and that the kingdom would be by his definition, not theirs. That it would have two elements, a spiritual element which they could get in on the moment they confessed their sins and became a believer and a follower of Jesus Christ, and that it included a political element that still is waiting to come. They didn't get any of that. Mostly what they weren't getting is that their hope needed to be not in a place, but in a person. Hope must be not in a place, but in a person. And so Jesus has to take a two before to their head. Sound familiar? Oh, how many two befores have I been through and not enough? These beautiful buildings, this religious system that they represented, Jesus is saying, it's all going to come down. It's all coming down. It's not going to last. Forty years to be exact is going to come down. So he's saying to them, you better center your hope in me alone. The key to this passage key to this passage is in verse 33. So if you're in Luke 21, just go down to verse 33 and look at this verse. It's in the center of the passage, but everything else revolves around this verse, which says what? Heaven and earth will pass away. They're gone. But my words will not pass away. Your hope is in the wrong place. Your hope is in something temporary. It needs to be in something permanent. The hope that you have in this temple will be gone when the temple's gone, if not before. The hope you place in me will be forever because my words are forever. See, they were still seeing Jesus at this point. They were still seeing Jesus as being part of the system instead of seeing Jesus as being Lord of the system. And they needed to come to understand that Jesus is Lord. Jesus is tearing down their old temple to make room for a new temple himself trying to teach them what he's been trying to teach them all along. He's not just an actor in the play. He's the owner, producer, director, and star of the whole drama, right? It's all about Jesus. That's what he's trying to get them to realize. That's what he's pointing them toward. Their faith has stopped one step short of reality. It's focused on the beautiful external things still, it will not last instead of the unapproachable, unbelievable beauty of their eternal Savior. They're trying to force new wine into old wineskins. Jesus repudiates the old to make room for the new. He destroys the old dreams to make room for new dreams. He destroys false hope to make room for true hope. He destroys fantasy to make room for reality. That's what Jesus is doing here. It's recalibration time. We'll see the details as we go through, but that's what this sermon that Jesus is going to preach is all about. It's recalibration time. So here's our question this morning. Where is our hope? Where's your hope? What is your temple? What are you trusting in? You know, if, 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 you, if you're like me, your security blanket could easily be your wife. I, the person I love most on this earth is my wife. 
It is very difficult when you love someone like that not to create an idol. Husbands, wives can become idols. But you see, one day one will be taken and the other will be left. We don't like to think that, but it happens. Your husband or wife cannot save you. Money comes easily or hard. It goes easily, I can tell you that. Money cannot save you. Family. You know, I remember how secure I used to feel in my family. We had, a, we had a wonderful family, as you've picked up. Eleven kids. We might squabble in, internally, but just let somebody from the outside pick on us, right? They had a fight on their hands. There was security there. Even as a teenager, as I was, you know, starting to feel my wings and wanting to get out and go, it was always really comfortable to know mom and dad were back there at home. I can remember times when I counted on the fact that they were there. But mom and dad are gone now to glory. Families dispersed. Family cannot save you. Career? Even if you make president, I promise you, it won't last long. Your career will not save you. Jesus said, there will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. What are you looking toward? What am I looking toward for my security, for my salvation, that will one day be torn down? down. Anything in this life is temporary, is it not? So we need to ask ourselves, the thing that I most makes life worth living for me, whatever that is, what's gonna, where's that going to be in a hundred years? And then you ask yourself, where am I going to be in a hundred years? And then you ask yourself, where should my faith be? Where does my hope have to be. What temple has to come down to make room for him? Now listen, beloved, I, this is kind of for unbelievers, I realize, but you know what? Believers can have idols just like unbelievers. We can revert to idol worship. You can't lose your salvation, and the fact is, if you're truly saved, you can never do this comfortably. This, the, the Bible seems to present that the, that the, that the tone of your life will be upward, even though you may have some ups and downs in there, the overall is going to be upward. That's what the Bible presents. And if you're not seeing that happen, you've got a problem, but we can still have idols. There's an interesting thing that happens in 2 Kings 18. You might want to look at it. 2 Kings 18. We're almost done. But in 2 Kings 18, Hezekiah has become king. Hezekiah was around 725, 720s, became king in Judah. He was a good man following a very evil father, which was common in Judah in those days. About a third of those kings were good, and about two-thirds of them were idol-worshiping dogs. And his father was one of the worst. So what did Hezekiah do when he came to the throne? 2 Kings 18, verse 4. 2 Kings 18, verse 4, he removed the high places. What are the high places? That's places of idol worship. He always picked a hill out there somewhere, built the, idol, the, the, the uh, altars, and that's where they worshiped. And he broke the pillars and cut down the Asherah. Asherah was one of the gods that required that children be sacrificed in the fire, along with Moloch. It was a horrible thing. And so Hezekiah had all of those torn down. That's a good move, right? Get rid of the idols. Get rid of the place where the idols are worshipped. Now look at verse, the, the, the rest of the verse. It says, and he broke in pieces the bronze serpent that Moses had made. Are you kidding me? They have this bronze serpent from the time of Moses. This was a good thing. Remember the children of Israel were, because of, because of their complaining, God finally said, that's enough. I'm going to send a bunch of snakes out there. It's going to bite them and kill them. And the snakes are biting them and killing them. And they come to Moses and said, what can we do? And, Moses, and God says to Moses, what can I do? And God said, raise up a bronze serpent. And whoever looks at that serpent will be healed. They'll be saved. This was a wonderful thing. 
It was so wonderful that here you are, 700 years after the event happened, and they still have the bronze serpent. That's impressive, isn't it? So why in the world would he break it down? The rest of the verse. For until those days, the people of Israel had made offerings to it. They had taken something good, and they had made something ultimate out of it. They were worshiping the wrong thing. And so Hezekiah said, I don't know what to do about that. We'll just get rid of it. It's exactly the same thing that God is saying in Luke. You want to worship this idolatrous system of salvation by works represented by this temple, then it's going to go away, as it did. He tore down the false temple to make room for Christ, just like Hezekiah tore down the false god of even the bronze serpent to make room for Christ. So what needs to be torn down in our lives? What are the idols? What are we worshiping? What are the temples that we're going to? How do you recognize an idolatrous temple? A.W. Tozer suggests seven questions to help. Please, listen carefully for yourself, not for the person sitting next to you. Here are the questions. What do I want most? What do I want most? What do I think about most? How do I use my money? How do I spend my leisure time? You know, on that one, Tim Keller has a great question. What do you think about when you're not thinking about anything else? Chances are you can spot your idol. Who and what do I admire? Question four. Question five, what company do I most enjoy? Question seven, what do I laugh at? You know, honest answers there, I think, would show us pretty clearly where our hope really lies. It needs to lie in Jesus alone. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for this word. We acknowledge that we often put our hope, find our... Lord, it isn't that you don't want us to enjoy good things. You give us all good things to enjoy. It's just that when we make them ultimate, like the children of Israel made this wonderful bronze serpent the ultimate, that it becomes wrong. And we acknowledge that we do that daily. Help us to see the beauty of who you are, to see the wonder of the Savior who has given his life to provide forgiveness and cleansing and salvation for us. Help us to see the one who will lead us in the right path, who will help us avoid so much of the turmoil of life if we will just put our trust in him. Help us to see him high and lifted up. So that the other things are going away, not just because they're wrong and bad and we don't like them, because a lot of them are good. So we pray that we could enjoy those, but not as the first place. May the first place be devoted to you. Pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.